Hey, you. Yeah, you. This is about stuff that happens in Iron Man 3. Important stuff. Spoiler stuff. Big, big, big spoiler stuff. If you haven't seen the movie yet and you don't want to have big parts of its plot spoiled, you probably don't want to watch all of this show. Sorry, that happens sometimes. <clears throat> all right, then. Prior to the movies, Iron Man had never been a character anybody that much cared about one way or the other, other than a couple memorable storylines and the fact that he was the guy who let the Avengers chill at one of his houses. And part of the reason for that might have been that his supporting cast, Reed Enemies, are kind of forgettable. Not only are most of them just other guys in robot suits, they're also dated as hell. For whatever reason, Iron Man was the book in the 60s and 70s that Marvel decided would be okay to go way heavy on the Cold War political paranoia stuff, so Tony Stark's rogues gallery was a lot of unpleasantly stereotypical Russian, Chinese, and Vietnamese communists that don't really hold up all that well today. The one great exception was the Mandarin, essentially a pulp-style, sinister oriental sorcerer archetype a la Fu Manchu or Ming the Merciless with the gimmick that his magical powers were actually super-advanced science called from a crashed alien spaceship. The Mandarin was one of the supervillain heavy hitters of the Marvel Universe, and since he technically originated in an Iron Man story, he gets to be Iron Man's ultimate foe, more or less by default. Unfortunately, it was always kind of doubtful that he would turn up in the movies because, well, while comic book fans have had a while to rationalize and work through the fact that as originally conceived, the Mandarin is kind of a racist caricature, movie audiences encountering him for the first time out of context would likely be less forgiving. Also, even after Iron Man's participation in the Avengers declared that pretty much everything was now on the table, the Mandarin is still pretty bizarre. And yet, there he was in the previews for Iron Man 3, Sir Ben Kingsley playing not only the Mandarin, but a really edgy take on the Mandarin, not only the familiar evil Chinese wizard, but a one-stop fusion of Osama Bin Laden, Kim Jong-il, cyber-terrorism, and radical anarchism of all stripes, a living amalgamation of Western post-9-11 terrorism fears so perfectly calculated, it's actually kinda suspicious. And that's because it is. Midway through the movie comes a surprise reveal that Marvel somehow managed to keep miraculously under wraps. Iron Man and the entire world got played. The Mandarin doesn't exist. Well, okay, there is technically an evil mastermind carrying out a campaign of terrorist attacks in the name of the Mandarin, but the guy we've been seeing is a fake, a frontman. He's a washed-up, drunken idiot actor named Trevor Slattery. The real big bad, who even ultimately calls himself the real Mandarin towards the end, is Guy Pierce as Aldrich Killian, a defense contractor who created a fictional evil mastermind to pass a series of accidents caused by his unstable technology off as terrorist attacks and now schemes to use him as a way of stage-managing the entire war on terror to his financial benefit. I love this twist. It's unexpected, it surprises the audience, it makes sense in terms of the established Iron Man setup and in the reality of post-Avengers Marvel Universe. It also makes for a great character. Kingsley's version of the Mandarin is appropriately menacing, sure, but Trevor Slattery is a riot, and his presence perfectly fits into the Iron Man series' action comedy tone. But a lot of people are annoyed by it, or they don't think it works, or they feel cheated because they thought they were getting a more authentic version of the Mandarin after it was teased for so long. I get that. I was looking forward to Iron Man fighting a wizard shooting lasers out of his fingers in an orientalist-themed castle or some such, but ultimately, I'm totally fine with where they went. Two main reasons. First, okay, look, the other big problem with the Mandarin, apart from the kind of offensive caricature stuff, is that as a movie villain, there's not much there there. He's Iron Man's top heavy in the comics, but there's not much that differentiates him from, say, Doctor Doom or just various James Bond villains other than culturally specific details. They'd have to give him a substantial rewrite either way just to give him something to do, and even then, let's face it, the best possible version of that classic Mandarin was already done as Lopan in Big Trouble in Little China. Seriously, you're not gonna do better than David Lopan. Secondly, it works. I mean, obviously your mileage may vary, but as far as I'm concerned, I love this guy. Trevor Slattery is a great character. His scenes are a ton of fun, and Killian's explanation for the whole thing, namely that he's been in the business of manipulating war for profit the whole time, but now that Thor and the Avengers happened, he decided he also needed to create a supervillain, is a very classic Marvel Comics kind of idea. See, at the end of the day, any adaptation of anything has to balance fidelity and affection for the source material with what's creatively right for the adaptation itself. Plus, a big part of what made the Silver Age comics where all this stuff comes from so interesting, in their own right, is that they weren't really all that concerned with pre-planning or second-guessing themselves. They were making up tons of crazy stuff every other day and carrying over the parts they liked, mixed, remixed, and remixed by subsequent years of writers. That's part of why I never got much into the Ultimate line. It never really got to the freshness it promised, just extreme versions of stuff that had already been done. So while this is a fairly significant change, it's a change into something interesting, something cool. Is it better? I don't know, but definitely cool. For me, this is a big difference from, say, the Ra's al Ghul twist in Batman Begins. 
Titans, where they made a potentially interesting character less interesting, mostly in the name of some fetish for realism. And since Killian turns out to be an invincible, fire-breathing lava person, which there actually isn't a proper image of available yet, but this is pretty close approximation, it's clear that realism was never a priority here. Hell, come to think of it, since Killian exits the movie going on about how he is the Mandarin, there's nothing that says he couldn't come back and decide to rock the robes and such for real. Yeah, I know they blew him up, but coming back from getting blown up is kind of his power. Plus, in case you've missed a couple of these movies, death is really more of an inconvenient detour in this world. Actually, you know what? Trevor Slattery still technically knows how to be the Mandarin, so there's also nothing that says he couldn't stumble upon some powers of his own and decide to take up the role for real. I mean, I don't expect that to happen, but... <laughs> You know what? I was kind of kidding, but now I totally want that to be Avengers 2. Thanos can wait. I want to see the Avengers fight crazy, drunken Ben Kingsley, but with magic rings. Seriously, think how awesome that would be. Like, imagine Captain America having a fight scene with this dude in his throne room is all full of empty Budweiser cans and stuff. You know that's awesome. Picture that dude versus the Hulk. That's a winning bit right there, and you know this. Imagine if Thor hits him with a hammer and it's all like, oh no, not that...